So our lesson for 2.2 .2 is going to be split into two different days, at least. And the first topic, we're going to talk about polynomial functions. We're going to cover um, the number of the possible number of zeros, how many turning points it might have, what the end behavior should look like. Um, what else we can cover? Yeah, finding the zeros through factoring. And then also we're going to talk about multiplicity finally. So a lot of this is going to be done without the use of graphing calculators. We're going to be able to kind of invent the function itself before we can determine any of those things. So this particular formula for polynomials always kind of kind of gets me. <laughs> It looks really, really complicated, and basically all it's saying is for a polynomial in standard form to be listed out, it's just a series of um, variable terms, you know, in decreasing ex uh, exponential order. And when you look at the lead term's exponent, once it's in standard form, that tells you the degree. And then the term, in, the coefficient in front of that term is called our lead coefficient. So just some vocabulary that you've seen before, but <laughs> this particular um, notation for polynomial always really mess, it messes with kids. It looks really scary. So a polynomial of degree zero is called our constant function, and it's just going to be a horizontal line through some given value. So like, for instance, y equals five would be at what, you know, y equals five. This particular one, if I counted right, is at y equals three. It would be any horizontal line would be a constant function. So then if you up the degree by one, you have a linear function. So anything in the form ax plus c you guys typically see that as mx plus b, but the idea is that the highest degree that you see on an exponent for x is a 1. Quadratic function is degree 2. Um, and then here's some examples of continuous polynomial functions, which in order for a, a function to be considered polynomial, it has to be a continuous function with, so no discontinuities, no sharp turns. Um, Algebraically speaking, we should be able to identify if something's a polynomial based on the way it originally is set up, or maybe we have to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation to determine if it's a polynomial. So remember, if we have an even degree, non-constant monomial function, like for instance, a quadratic x squared, um, but it could be something that's similar, like remember we thought x to the fourth, that quartic, monomial function also looked a lot like a quadratic. x to the sixth would also look like a quadratic if it's just a monomial power function. The idea is we're going to see that he has multiplicity of the zeros um, at x equals zero. Now if you have an odd degree monomial function, power function from the last section, like x to the third or x to the fifth, x to the seventh, it's going to resemble our cubic function. And we're going to find out what happens to multiplicity and what it what it does to change the graph in the near future. So graphing transformations of those power functions, if we have x minus 2 to the fifth power, it's going to take that what used to look you know just like a cubic function basically, and it's going to shift it to the right two units. Well that's not new. <laughs> so if I say negative x to the fourth and then plus 1, that is a um, reflection across the x-axis and then a translation of up one. Remember if that reflection is just in front of this term and not the one, that you have to make sure that that reflection happens before you do the up one shift. Otherwise it's gonna affect that vertical shift. We talked about the order of transformations before. So here, um, this particular function, it's a little bit in a backwards order. It's negative x to the third and then plus four. So again, we're gonna have that reflection across the x-axis. So instead of having a cubic that looks like this, you know, it would have looked like this, except ours was shifted up four units. So, you know, my sketches are always dynamite, right? <laughs> so it's going to look something like this. Ooh, that was actually pretty good. All right, so then this power function of this quartic used to look like a parabola. However, it's been shifted left seven. So if I shift everything left seven, it's going to look, you know, something like this. Use your imagination on that one. That wasn't very good. So if we look at the lead term, and we can determine whether it's positive or negative for coefficient and whether the degree is even or odd, we should be able to tell you what the ends of the function look like. We might not know what's happening in the middle as far as like how many x-intercepts and the wiggles it has, but the end behavior should be, de you know, we can determine it from those two things. We call this the lead term test or the lead coefficient test. If you have an odd degree, but with a positive coefficient, the ends are going to do this. Now, this is called the limit notation for end behavior. 
um, we're still using our regular f of x approaches blank as x goes to negative infinity all that regular end behavior notation that's not going to change for us however if you have an odd degree with a negative lead coefficient the ends are going to do the opposite they're going to go like this so again the middle i have no idea what's going to happen in the middle until i investigate further but i can tell you what the ends look like if you have an even degree with a positive coefficient all i know for certain is that the ends do this and then if i have even degree with a negative coefficient I don't know what happens in the middle, but I know that the ends do that. So whenever I set up end behavior, I mean, really, it's just due to my dyslexia. <laughs> the first thing I do is I either get a picture of my function or I just kind of sketch the ends real quick on my paper because, you know, I confuse my directions I always have ever since I was, you know, like seven. I've always confused them. All right, so here's an example of um, a, a function that has an even degree and a positive lead coefficient. So like 3x to the fourth, you know, whatever the rest of it is, appears, something like this. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what happens in the middle, but I know that the ends are going to look like this. We have an even degree with a negative lead coefficient, so all I have to do is just kind of throw a negative in front of that same term, and then who cares what happens after it? I know that the ends are going to look like, jeez, it's ugly, <laughs> they're going to look like this. And then if I have an odd degree, but a positive lead coefficient, so let's keep my three coefficient, but an odd degree, let's change it to like three to the uh, x to the third power, and then blah, 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 who cares what happens next? I know that the ends are going to look like this. And then if I have an odd degree, but a negative lead coefficient, so let's keep that same function, but let's throw a negative in front of the lead term. And then again, who cares what happens there? My ends are going to look like this. So. Um, in the power function section, we did mention that because of the simplicity of the power functions, when it was an even power function, which was a monomial function, that was kind of synonymous with it being um, an even function as far as symmetry came. And that was true, but it might not be true anymore. Because remember, if we have extra terms along with the polynomial, like for instance, um, you know, x to the fourth plus 3x minus 1. At first glance, you might think that's an even function because of the even degree, but remember the even test is if I swap out a negative x where all my x's are, it has to give me the same function back again. And this one would not. It would give me x to the fourth and then a minus 3x minus 1. So because of this little funky weird term in the middle um, that is going to create this, it won't create symmetry is what I'm looking for. So in this case, that function was not even. It did have an even degree, but it was not an even function. So please, just please be careful. The more complicated the function, the more complicated the math. <laughs> Who would have thought? So here, they graphed it for us down here, but I don't think they had to. If you just do the lead term test, fourth degree with a positive coefficient, the ends are going to do that. So for our end behavior, you know, we like to see this notation. Um, the function is going up as x's go to the left. Ooh, I didn't finish my infinity, sorry. <laughs> and then my function is also going up as my x's go to the right. And again, we talked in the last lesson about how I was starting to get a little lazy. And I was writing y approaches infinity and y approaches infinity here. It's okay. I'll accept that. Personally, you know, I just kind of have it. I write f of x all the time. So, um... Describe the end behavior of this graph using limits. Explain your reasoning. Okay, so is this the same question? It's not, but this is a pretty boring question because look, guys, 3x to the fourth, still positive, still an uh, even degree. So aren't the ends just going to do this again? So it's the same as the last question. Boring. All right, now this one. <laughs> it's a big warning. Be careful. Boom, look at that guy. So negative 2x to the 7th power is going to be an odd degree with a negative coefficient. So the ends are going to do this, where it's like kind of like a cubic, but it's going to be reflected. So I think what's behind this box is the limit notation. <laughs> Surprise. Um, but what we're going to be doing for end behavior, we're just going to do the regular, um, basically the same thing. You just kind of take this limit notation and take off the limit component and add a little approaching arrow. 
a little bit of a backwards order, but it's the function approaches infinity as x goes to the left, and the function approaches negative infinity as x goes to the right. So, whoop de doo same business, I know. <laughs> so let's talk about our, um, our other polynomials. Third degree is called cubic. Fourth degree is quartic. Um, if you're curious, fifth degree is quintic. And then we just kind of, we don't need to worry about names after that. <laughs> so we really don't see them too often. But a cubic function, depending on how many turning points it has, it could look really, really different. So like this one, a, a cubic function can have at most two extrema, one max, one min. Um, it doesn't have to have that many even. It could not really have any extrema um, in this particular case. And let's see, let's see. The amount of x-intercepts a cubic function could have, or zeros I should call them, is three. There's actually a theorem that we're going to talk about in a second that tells you how many um, extrema and how many turning, uh, how many extrema and how many zeros it could have. So a quartic function, this is like a really boring quartic function that doesn't do much, but this is a more elaborate quartic function that has, look at this guy, one, two, three, four zeros. And then if you notice how many extrema he has, got three extrema. But now these are kind of cousins of each other. They're the same degree function, but notice they look really, really different. And that has to do with the type of factors um, and then essentially zeros that it has and the multiplicity of had really. So a turning point is where a function changes from increasing to decreasing. We saw that in the last chapter. And maximum and minimum are located at those turning points. So relative max and relative mins. Cubic function that we notice had at most two turning points. Quartic function had at most three turning points. So I wonder if we can kind of generalize that as a theorem. This is your theorem. <laughs> So the polynomial of degree uh, greater than 1 has at most n zeros and n minus 1 turning points. So for instance, if you know the degree, call it n, that is the maximum number of zeros that the function could have. But if you take one away from that, or we call it n minus 1, that's the maximum number of possible turning points. I think that got cut off on my screen there. So this example here is a degree 6, which means it could have a possible 6 zeros. It doesn't, but it, well, kind of does. We'll talk about that later. Possible 6 zeros, and it could possibly have 5 turning points. Now, I'd see from the graph it doesn't really have all that going on. That was just the most possible it could have. Um, we'll talk about why we don't see as many as we did. In a moment. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of vocab. <laughs> There's a lot of vocab here. So if I tell you that you have a polynomial and you set it equal to zero and you solve, C is considered a zero of the function if C is a solution to this equation. Oops, 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 oops. And then if you could rewrite it as x minus c is a factor. So like for instance, if you know x equals 2 is a solution, if you kind of work backwards and we write it in factored form, x minus 2 would be the factored um, component to that once we get the polynomial in factored form. Um, sometimes kids confuse the, the concept of x-intercept with a 0. Not all zeros are x-intercepts. We're going to see in a second. Uh, it says right here that x-intercepts are also called zeros. That's not always true because we're going to see in a moment something called multiplicity where the function might, you know, bounce off the x-axis, doesn't actually intercept it in any way. So be careful. Some textbooks are like real specific about that. and <laughs> Some textbooks really don't care if you call them x-intercepts. Technically, they're not x-intercepts unless they cross the threshold of the axes because they were a a positive function on one side and a negative part of the function on the other. So I know all my textbooks used to call it. That was their definition of an x-intercept. So they, they would even go as far. I know in the college algebra textbook it does where it says, you know, list out all the zeros, claim which ones are x-intercepts. Um, so we'll see a case of when they're not x-intercepts. So this particular question is a, a hoot. It's a four-term polynomial. And in order to um, state the possible number of real zeros, we just have to identify the degree. Possible turning points is one less than that. So the degree is three. So it could have three real zeros. Oops. <laughs> and it could have two turning points. Okay. 
and then it wants me to factor the polynomial, which they chose by grouping. So they, these two and these two, and they factored out the common term of each group, and then turns out they had a common x plus 2 to take out of it. And then the remaining factor of x squared minus 1 could factor again into x plus 1, x minus 1. And look what happens when you solve each one of these factors. You get negative 1, positive 1, and negative 2. So we did find um, three distinct, three different zeros, and it will have two turning points. You could confirm that through graphing. Um, trying to think if there's another way for you to confirm it easily. I mean, really. <laughs> you can totally find it easy. All right, so this particular question, degree is four, means there's a possibility of four zeros and three turning points. But let's see what actually happens when we factor it. So x to the fourth, let's factor them into x squared terms. And then plus 18 adds up to negative nine. How about minus six and minus three? So, I mean, you can continue to factor this, but if you went ahead and solved this, you would get um, a set of zeros at plus and minus six. Oh, no, you went square root of six and plus and minus square root of three. But they're not pretty zeros, and they're surely not things that I could, you know, confirm on my calculator without using a little bit of the calc feature. But um, I, I did find four zeros. So same idea here. Um, your degree is three. This, uh, oh, it's five. So the possible number of zeros is five. Possible turning points is four. Let's see what happens when I actually factor it. So the first thing I notice is I could take out an x from the expression. <sighs> and then that factors pretty nicely. So x squared, let's see, minus eight plus two squared plus two, excuse me. So if you think about solving this, this first guy will give me an x as zero. This next dude will give me um, x equals plus and minus square root of 8, which will be, you know, 2 squared to 2. So those are 1, 2, 3, 0 so far. And then there's that guy. So this one will give you complex solutions. So unreal solutions, imaginary solutions. And we're only interested in real solutions at the moment. Um, oh, you know what? No, we're not. It didn't say real. I made that up. <laughs> so x squared plus 2 equals 0. So if I subtract 2 and square root both sides, I get, oh, jeez, <laughs> plus and minus i times the square root of 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 solutions. I did find 5. Two of them were not real. They have to come in complex pairs. And then three of them were real. So this particular one, if I look at the lead term, it's an odd degree with... Uh, a negative coefficient. So my end behavior is going to look something like this, yeah? So I don't even need to graph all of it. All I really care about is it, if it's, that's all they want is end behavior, I got it. f of x equals infinity, or approaches infinity as x approaches negative infinity. And then f of x approaches negative infinity goes down as your x travels to the right. So your book assignment on this lesson is just, it's a bunch of this. So they're going to have you state possible number of zeros and turning points, and then use your factoring skills to find all the zeros. Um, let's take a look at, let's see, that one's pretty boring. Let's look at these. So if you have zeros that repeat algebraically, meaning their factor shows up more than once, that's considered to be multiplicity. If a zero has odd multiplicity, then the function is going to cross the x-axis at that value, but it's going to um, kind of hang out there for a while. So like, for instance, if you found out that the solution of negative 2 shows up a few times, multiplicity like t um, 3, so it would kind of hang out, like almost go flat, and then eventually cross through. Um, however, if you have even multiplicity, it's going to be tangent to the x-axis, and it's just going to touch, or some people call it kissing, on uh, the x-axis. This is a case where the function doesn't actually cross the x-axis. So if it asks you for who an x-intercept, this one would not count as an x-intercept. It is a zero. It is a solution. Um, just the fact that it shows up an even number of times means it's going to you know, bounce. That's another word a lot of people use, bounce, off the x-axis. Um... Let's see. Look at this one. 
Apply the lead term test, determine the zeros, blah, 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 find additional points, and then graph it. Oh, well, sure, why not? <laughs> okay. So, um, this is going to be ugly. So, my lead term, so my lead coefficient, my lead term, if I think about having negative 2 times x, and then times this x, and then times this 3x, but that guy's being taken to the third power. So notice I left off all the other terms. I'm just going to multiply the lead terms of everybody together. That's going to be like negative 2 times x times x with negative 2x squared. But if I multiply that by 27x to the third, yikes, <laughs> I end up with negative 54x to the fifth. <laughs> so super negative coefficient with an odd degree, my end behavior is going to look like that. So apply the lead term test. It's going to end up being negative and odd, which means I would set up end behavior like that, which, whatever. If they wanted it, they would have asked for it. And then part B, determine the zeros and state to multiplicity. So, good news. Someone already came through and factored it for me. So the first zero I see is where I set this monomial equal to zero, so I have one at zero. And then if I set this equal to zero and solve, I get four. And then when I set this one equal to zero, I'm going to get one third. But notice how there's a third power after that. That indicates that it's, it, that factor would show up three times. So we're going to just write multiplicity. You can abbreviate three after that one third. So now for the super fun part, me trying to graph. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So remember how we said there's something weird going on at... Um, one third has that multiplicity of three. So like something weird happens here. I'm gonna put like a little star on the axes. It's a, oh gosh, this is gonna be so hard to graph. Okay, one, two, three, four. So those are the x-intercepts. This first one at zero, this last one at four, and then something weird happens here. So I'm gonna kind of because I've already done this one, right? <laughs> if I uh, oh gosh, so ugly. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> oh my lordy. All right. So this is a really good example of why we use technology. <laughs> oh, that is bad. Okay. So <laughs> because this has an odd multiplicity, I'm confident that it does cross through the x-axis. What I am not confident about is my ability to graph what this actually looked like. Even if I had a picture of it in front of me, there's no chance that I'd be graphing that. Like, so I apologize. I know from my lead term test that the ends do go up here and down here. So, And uh, I really don't know what happens in between here. I have a feeling it goes like way high or way low, and I, I can't graph. So apology. All right, so my lead coefficient test on this next one. I don't have to test anything because my lead coefficient is negative uh, one, and then my term is um, an odd degree. So again, my end behavior should look like so. A bit of bad news. Nobody factored this for me. So if I factor out, and I'm actually going to take out a negative x this time. I don't like that lead term being negative. So x squared minus 2x minus 8. And if I continue to factor that, they'll have a negative x in front, then I have x minus 4 times x plus 2. So my zeros, I can clearly see now that they're factored, are going to be at 0, 4, and negative 2. Now, in theory, it should be way easier for me to graph, right? Famous last words, of it, though. <laughs> so bad. All right, there's an intercept. There, there. And remember I said the ends, you know, we're doing their thing over here. So <laughs> nailed it. Okay. <laughs> Not at all what it looks like. Okay. Uh the ends are good, the intercepts are good. The middle, I mean, you know, whatever. That's the beauty of not actually labeling your axes. I could just claim that I forgot to label them and they're totally fine. They're not fine, by the way. I did a really bad job. Okay, so one more time. This one, for the lead term, it would be negative x and then times 2x, but that's been doubled. 
and then another x. So if I think about multiplying that all together, I would have negative x times 4x squared times another x, which would be, oh gosh, negative 4x to the fourth. So that's an even degree uh, with a negative coefficient. So it's going to look like so. Again, they already factored it for me, so yahoo. If only I could graph. I can't. <laughs> okay. Can't even draw lines anymore. All right, so this um, one of the x intercepts will be at 0, and then 1 at 3. And then this guy will be negative 2.5, because it'll be negative 5 halves. Look here. But this one's special, because it's got a um, bin multiplicity. So when you go to list out your zeros, and you say you have one at 0 and 3, and then when you list this one at negative 5 halves, you need to make sure you write down that it has multiplicity 2, indicating it's going to bounce. Um, the other thing you have to remember is the end behavior. So when you go to like figure out what this guy looks like, I know the end is, you know, it's going to be down like this. And so it's going to bounce off of here. I know this guy is going to do something. I don't know what. And then it's going to go like this. And then it's going to have to, you know, go up for a while and then come back down. So remember we said at the way beginning, the ends are going to have to be going down on both sides. So I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's because I think I'm a lost cause for graph. Okay, so that's our first part of our lesson on 2.2. The next part of the lesson, like I'm all about it because it's going to be on our calculator and we're going to be doing regression equations. And we're going to be able to determine which kind of regression equation is appropriate for that given polynomial. Once I look at the scatter plot, it's going to be wonderful, mostly because I don't have to graph a single thing on the next one. Look forward to that one.